I hear something beautiful. My name is Mark Segrist. I'm the president of Instruments of Hope. We're a nonprofit organization. Our mission is promoting peace through artistic endeavors in the spirit of St. Francis. And we're building this wonderful, beautiful sculpture garden. We want to create an atmosphere where peaceful people can recharge. Because waging peace is hard work. And it's not always easy to keep the balance that you need because you need peace within yourself before you can have any hope of spreading it. Welcome everyone. We're so happy that you're here this afternoon in Dominican Chapel, Marywood. I'm Jana Brown. I'm a Dominican sister and the liturgical life director here at Marywood. Today, we gather as one, as brothers and sisters, one family of the earth. We gather because there's a need for peace. Peace in our world and peace in our hearts. Nothing is more urgent than to secure local and international peace and, and the promotion of a right to peace, the theme of today's service. As people of different ethnic cultural, political, religious, and non-religious backgrounds, we seek and we find common ground. We come together to build a future full of hope. Love is eternal hope. In each other, we see the way to peace. In each other, we see the face of God or in other words, the face of family. Through this time together today, we join our hearts and voices in union with family all around the world who hunger for peace. May we always be signs of hope and people of peace. Welcome. sponsored by the Institute for Global Education, the Dominican Sisters Grand Rapids, and also by the Instruments of Hope, which have the St. Francis Sculpture Garden in our front yard. And every, as every year, we get a proclamation for this day from the Mayor's Office. Whereas peace transcends all differences and brings hope for the future, whereas the United Nations has declared an annual International Day of Peace devoted to commemorating and strengthening the ideas of peace, both within and among all nations and peoples. Whereas furthering this day's mission the United Nations General Assembly has established September 21st as the annual day of nonviolence and ceasefire. Whereas this year's International Day of Peace theme is the right to peace, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at 70 years old. This is the 70th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration of the, right, the Human Rights. Whereas our community's observance of the International Day of Peace affirms a vision of our world at peace and fosters cooperation among individuals, organizations, and nations. Whereas we must work together toward world peace for all people today and well into the future. 
Now, therefore, I, Roslyn Bliss, Mayor of the City of Grand Rapids, do hereby proclaim September 21st, 2018, as the International Day of Peace in Grand Rapids, and encourage all citizens to participate in events that celebrate and observe peace in our community. In our scripture reading that we read today at Mass, the disciples are fighting about who is the most important. <laughs> and so much of our conflict comes from that, from important. And so Jesus does a prophetic act. He brings a child in front of them, puts his arms around the child, and says, this is what it means to be a servant, to have a servant's heart, is to care for one of these little ones. In the Catholic Church, we're struggling very visibly, openly, with the issue of how to care for little ones, how to care for those that have been victimized, to listen to their voices, to let them have a voice, to let them speak. And what do we do with those who have victimized them, and then those who have moved the victimized so they can victimize again? And personally, I struggle with that a lot. Personally, the feeling of just tension and sadness that this has gone on for so long and we still haven't figured out how to deal with it. But I'm so happy that it's been brought out into the open, that it continues to be brought out into the open, and that the church is struggling with the help of the authorities and with the press, the judicial, and all of the areas of life that have helped the Catholic Church face this it's such a positive thing for the Catholic Church. So if we talk about peace, we have to talk about taking care of the little ones. I'd like to read something from Francis. It talks about another one of the little ones that we have to care for, which is our earth. Laudato Si. Praise be to you, my Lord. In the words of this beautiful canticle, St. Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. Praise be to you, my Lord, for our sister Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us, who produces various fruit of colored flowers and herbs. The sister cries out to us because the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods which God endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our world groans and travail. We have forgotten that we are the dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive light and refreshment from her waters. I urgently appeal then for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. We need a conversation that involves everybody since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. I'd like you to sing with me if you know this. Because it's so important that every one of us do what we can do at our level. Follow the call of our Lord. Figure out what it is that each one of us can do. Brothers, and sister moon, I seldom see you. Preoccupied with selfish misery, brother wind and sister prayer, open my eyes to visions pure and Right. 
past to speak only a few minutes on how faith traditions promote peace. And also to couch it within the context of this year's International Day of Peace theme of the 70th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights. But perhaps we can sum everything up into one word at the end of this brief talk. When the Buddha sat underneath the Bodhi tree 2,500 years ago and stated that he would not rise from his spot until he attained enlightenment or became awake, he was seeking the answer to the age-old question of what is it that causes our suffering? We are human beings, beings of flesh and bone, so it's inevitable that we will suffer. But how can we transcend our suffering? And what happens when we can transcend our suffering? In what ways will the release of our suffering and the subsequent experience of inner peace impact ourselves and those around us? How can any sense of peace that we may cultivate in ourselves ripple out into our relationships and into families and then into communities, into towns and cities, into countries, and eventually impact the peacefulness of our planet? Buddhism is a faith tradition that offers scriptural and contemplative tools such as various kinds of meditation so that we may train our own minds to come face to face with our suffering, to understand that there is a cause of our suffering. Most of the time, we cause our own suffering, by the way. That there is a way out of suffering and that the path to inner peace, a path to relief from our suffering, called the Noble Eightfold Path, was left to us by the Buddha. We don't worship the Buddha as an entity outside of ourselves. We recognize his example inside of ourselves. And we work to cultivate the seeds of compassion, of understanding, of generosity that are naturally within us so that we may ourselves be at peace and that the manifestation of our peacefulness will benefit not only ourselves, but all beings across time. We call this inner nature Buddha nature an innate perfection that is our birthright, all of our birthrights, that connects us no matter how different we may seem in other ways. Caring for and cultivating our Buddha nature happens in our faith tradition through study and contemplative practice, primarily through meditation, and the resulting expression of our meditative insights in real life. From the Buddhist scripture called the Dhammapada, verses 1 and 2, our life is shaped by our mind. We become what we think. Suffering follows an evil thought as the wheels of a cart follow the oxen that draw it. Our life is shaped by our mind. We become what we think. Joy follows a pure thought like a shadow that never ceases. Now to tie into the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The preamble of the Declaration reads, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. The Declaration goes on over the course of 30 articles to describe in detail what this means in practical terms. Here are a few examples. Article 3. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security in person. <clears throat> Article 4. No one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Article 6. Everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Article 14. Everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. We as human beings tend to make judgments and develop biases and cultivate prejudices based on differences that we can see and experience and perceive differences that are a product of our own minds. And as human beings, we can be very creative as to the differences we see in each other. When the tenets of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are not honored, it's because the focus is more on the differences we see in each other rather than commonalities. We see a fellow being as less than because they're not like us. And so we treat him or her differently. So for a species that is as diverse as we human beings are, physically, culturally, linguistically, geographically, what is it that we all have in common? 
from a Buddhist perspective, it's the Buddha nature that I mentioned before, our inner perfection. And for Buddhists, we aspire to train our minds to recognize the Buddha nature in ourselves and in our fellow beings, so much so that the idea of the other, all of those differences that we perceive, dissolve away. When one person looks upon another, no matter what their differences, may be the connection between Buddha nature to Buddha nature, heart to heart, translates into love. The one important word I mentioned in the top of this talk. From unconditional, unquestionable love flows compassion, generosity, understanding, equanimity, service and action on behalf of all beings, and peace. Only when we are able to love all humans, all beings, no matter what our differences, only then will we have achieved the peace that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights promises. From the Dhammapada, verse 5. For hatred can never put an end to hatred. Love alone can. This is an unalterable law. People forget that their lives will end soon. For those who remember, quarrels come to an end. I read this on Facebook. Almost anything will work better if you unplug it for five minutes. <laughs> Even you. <laughs> this says exactly what I want to say about my topic, about Judaism, about peace, about the United Nations anniversary. I am here at the Interfaith Service for Peace representing Judaism. The organizers asked me to pick one article in the UN Declaration of Human Rights to analyze through a Jewish lens. In that list of 30, one fits Judaism perfectly. It is Article 24, which says, everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitation of working hours and periodic holidays with pay. Now, you may have heard of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> This list has a prominent place in Judaism. The first three commandments establish who God is in God's terms and how God wants us to act towards God. And I won't say more. Then we get the next seven commandments, which are the important practices God wants Jews to follow. Starting with number four, the first practice listed is this. And I'm going to quote it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord your God. In it, you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is, in, who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. People have often refer to this commandment as the first labor law, guaranteeing people the right to at least one day of rest a week. This law is not just for the boss, but for his children, his servants, his animals, his guests, regardless of sex, status, or species. If you are a him, her, or it, if you own or control a him, her, or it, he, she, or it gets to rest on the Sabbath. The Sabbath runs from sundown Friday night in Judaism to star rise on Saturday. This is a time of complete peace when we are not to do anything, even remotely considered work. Notice that this is the first practice listed. 
It's listed before, don't kill, don't steal. The Ten Commandments list the Sabbath first. This shows the importance we give to the Sabbath, the practice of rest and peace. Experts say that Judaism is the oldest continuously practiced religion. This year may be 2018 on your calendar, but on our calendar, the year is 5779, and we just had the years. Through thousands of years, there were times when we Jews have not had or granted anyone freedom of movement, of speech, of assembly, of right to property, or many of the other rights enumerated in the UN Declaration of, of Human Rights. Jews have owned slaves, and they have been slaves. But since the founding of our faith, we Jews have always given anyone who lives with us, Article Number 24, the right to leisure, resting, me, resting up time, going around time, doing nothing time, because we humans do better if we unplug. One day per week, no. In ancient times, if the courts condemned a man to death, they could not carry out the sentence on the Sabbath. I thought about this, looking for a profound metaphysical meaning about the day of peace. But, alas, no. Or maybe the most simple explanation is the most profound. Executions did not take place on the Sabbath because the one with the least prestigious job, the executioner, did not have to work. <laughs> Everyone gets the day off from the highest high to the lowest low. I'm going to end the poem I wrote about the Sabbath, just because I'm a poet, and if you're going to put me in front of a microphone, I'm going to read it. The Sabbath is the best, blessed day of rest. For him and them and he and she and you and me, not just for some, but for everyone. Even God, who is everywhere and everywhere, gets a day off now and again. Because even in heaven, they get to take off one out of seven. Even the executioner gets a break, gets to take a day off for heaven's sake. <laughs> when I got the uh, phone call, or I think it was an email, I can't remember which, inviting me to join you all on this day, I was given the instruction of reading something from the Universal Declaration and commenting on it from a Hebrew point of view. And I was reminded of that instruction recently. And by recently, I mean the last few minutes of the previous speakers. <laughs> Guess who didn't do his homework? <laughs> <laughs> no, Sister Patricia, when she saw me walk in, uh, she beckoned me here and she gave a universal sign of, you know, come here. I had a little bit of PSTD I did because going to Catholic school for so many years, that gesture never resulted in anything. <laughs> so I apologize, but. Uh, what I had planned on doing, uh, and, and I will do it uh, if, if you don't mind, is a uh, Hindu peace chant. Um, it consists of only two words, and you're certainly invited to join me if you are so inclined. The words are simply Om Shanti. And I'll explain what those words mean. Everybody has an idea that Hindus go around shaking 
old. But most people don't know why Hindus chant Om. And the, the, why it is that Om is a sacred symbol, it is a word, and it is one of the many names for God. And it symbolizes that aspect of God that is imminent in creation. We understand divinity to be both transcendent and imminent. And Om is the creative source. Om was considered the vibration that began this entire physical universe. When a Hindu looks at the beginning, the Gospel of John, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Hindu understands that to be Om. And then the word Shakti means peace. And whenever we, uh, whenever we chant a, a, a shloka, a verse from our scriptures, a prayer, we always end it with Om Shanti. Shanti, Shanti. We chant Shanti three times. And the reason for that is that we are asking peace to come in three different ways. The first Shanti, uh, we are invoking the, our physical space, if you will, the world, to bring us peace. That is, that while we are here right now, let us be free from tornadoes, from earthquakes, from a tree falling on the building, by any of those things that would disrupt our peace that come from nature. The second chanting of Shanti, we ask that we would be relieved from any human intervention that might disrupt our peace, from some knucklehead playing his grunge music too loud to a, a, a force, an armed, armed force attempting to make war upon us. The third shot is we pray that we ourselves individually do not disrupt our peace, that our minds be settled, that our minds be centered, that our minds free from anxiety and free from fear. So, I'm going to chant Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. If you would like, just close your eyes and begin to follow along with me for just, just a couple of moments. And as you're chanting, feel that you are invoking the divine and that peace may come to this place at this time. Om Shanti 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 Om Shanti 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 Om Shanti 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 Om Shanti Shanti
many Hindus, Muslims, Sufis, Christians, all went through their home, and he imbibed from all of them. The lineage that he came from, there's four Sufi lineages that came through Arabia, Persia, and India that Hazrat Nayak Khan was steeped in as he lived in the Kanka with his own worship. And he was a musician himself. And his merchant said, it's time for you to go to souls. And so he left India, and he came to Europe, and Russia, and North America. And he brought with him that rich tradition of the Sufi masters of old. But he attuned the souls of today's world with um, his beautiful words that are still very current for today. And um, I kind of chose Article 29 because when I read that, that's exactly Hasra Khan's message. Everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. <coughs> and I'm going to talk about the ego personalities, but that shining personality as we lift the veils that we've inherited from our families and our communities and our cultures, as we can lift those veils, that shining light that we all are from will come through and will be a better service to this world and to those that are suffering. And I think everybody, all of us, wants to live a life that has more zest and more meaning with more serenity and more joy. So when I try to think about what would Sufism say about peace, well, it's about your daily life. When you're in a, a situation with your family or at work and something happens and you have a reaction to that because of anger or judgment or maybe even joy, where does that come from? And how do I deal with that? Well, in, in our path, in the Nayati path, we take a breath. We have breath practices for concentration and, and contemplation, meditation. And when you take initiation, you're given a guide. So that you have somebody in this life to call on. You can read the scriptures. And Hazrat Nayak Khan used all the scriptures of all religions. And you can do that, but there's nothing like having a guide to prescribe certain breath practices, or we use the um, wazifas, which are the 99 beautiful names of God, in pairs. And they're much like mantras, where they have a vibration and, and they work on your soul. You first need to say them rolling automatically, but pretty soon you get to know them. And things start working in your life. And it's a daily practice. And actually, one of the definitions of a Sufi is one who breathes well. Meaning that each breath we take, we remember God. So that we're in a situation at work, and somebody, we, we're reacting, we don't just spew out words, we take a breath. And then we ask for guidance. And maybe we speak, and maybe we don't. And maybe we remember some practice that our mercy taught us. And maybe we have to call our guide and ask what to do. And then later on, if that happens again, you're not so as affected. So it's a very personal path. It's a very practical path. And um, in our, and we, we meet together twice a month. And so when one or more are gathered in my name, as Jesus said, that power grows. And your community helps and supports you. And then you can go out into the world and be an atmosphere of peace because you have it in your heart. And you're learning all the time because, honestly, daily life is food for our inner work. And it never stops. So that invocation that I spoke was given to us by Hazard and Icon, but he also gave breath practices and, and other things, too. But we have... Within the Nayati order, there's kinship, chivalry, um, the healing order, the Shrak order, which is ordained ministers. And David Tite is our leader, and um, she had 
beautiful healing meditation for the earth that I'd like to share with you. Um, if you want to close your eyes <clears throat> and just feel your feet upon Mother Earth. Breathe in through the soles of your feet, connecting the minerals of the earth to the minerals of your bones and stones of your own body. We all have calcium, phosphorus, nitrogen, and all the others. Know that you're connected to her. Breathing in and up and through the heart, exhale, expanding your vision of yourself beyond the body. To this room, this chapel, to the beautiful people beside you. Exhaling out into Michigan. Now North America. Now expanding your consciousness to the galaxy. Feel as big as the galaxy. See our world, all the people and the planets and the animals, the oceans. We all blend as one world. Now hold that world in your hands. Hands filled with love and tenderness. Beloved Lord, Almighty God, through the rays of the sun, through the waves of the air, through the operating life in space, purify and revivify this beautiful being, and I pray, heal her body, heart, and soul. And gather yourself back into this beautiful chapel of Mary.
recessives and Nietzsche movements appear to go unnoticed. Where is our faith when it appears as if unemployment continues to rise and persons still not get a fair, fair wage? Where is our faith when housing and health care and medication is in question? Where children are subject to mistaken identities due to phone calls here and there? Where gun violence and racial profiling still continues to be more than otherwise? Where is our faith when boys and girls can't even walk down the streets together, just laughing and wanting to be children, not wanting to have to grow up so quickly? We call upon a higher, higher power, our faith in the one that calls us even in the midst of this violent world, where we question what is next. We call upon a higher power to fulfill the promise that we all can be instruments of our peace. We call upon a higher power where even in this war and conflict around the world, where powers and principalities so easily divide upon us, we call upon a higher, higher power, even in the midst of individuals that have survived sexual violence, gone through the hardships of silence. We call upon the higher power that will allow us to see that even in the midst of injustice and pain, we can still make it. Why do we have faith? We have faith that will see us through tough times. Faith that will unite our hearts and make us stronger. Because we will be able to sing as the saints go, one day when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea gulls roll, whatever my life thou hast taught me to say, it truly will be well with my soul. So may we continue to find peace by having faith in a higher power. Until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. May we find peace that surpasses all of our understanding. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with you and let it begin with me. That is. So we have to 
Um, as far as Islam and human rights, I'm just going to mention some things um, which are, that is a brief list of things from the Quran that I just mentioned that once. Uh, number one, Islam undermines justice. So uh, the Quran says, be just even if it is against your fathers, your parents, your, your relatives, or your friends. So justice is the underpinning of human rights. Um, number two, Islam repeatedly undermines compassion. For example, um, a verse in the Quran says that God has made it binding upon himself. Now the himself, the, the gender is gender neutral, but there's no other word, it's not he, she, or it. Um, God has made binding upon God that his mercy shall be shall take precedence over his justice or his anger. Okay? So, so the underpinning of all our actions have to be based on mercy. Okay? And the third thing is, um, in Islam the only thing that can make one person better than another is God consciousness. So uh, again, uh, there's no such thing as you being better because of you being born in a certain area or you know in a certain language or you follow in a certain religion. It is those who are more mindful of God that are superior to others in the eyes of God. That's the verse from the Quran. The, in, in that uh, I made you out of dust and the only one who's, who's superior to another person is the one who is more conscious of God. Uh, number four, uh, Islam underlines respect for contracts and does not tolerate any violation of pledges. Um, number five, Islam never considers to anything more than a reciprocal action. So if somebody behaves unjustly with you, justice uh, demands that you cannot deal with, uh, with an action that is greater than the injustice of you. And compassion demands that you deal with mercy. So justice and compassion are both together. But, but you cannot, uh, the proportion cannot be uh, out of, uh, out of, out of uh, proportion. Uh, Islam underlines individual responsibility. So you are responsible for your actions. Um, and uh, um, taking a life is considered taking the life of all humanity. And that's the same thing with Judaism as well. And saving a life is considered the same as saving the life of all humanity. Okay? So this is some, these are some things from the Quran that I mentioned. And I was going to say, I was going to mention the Ten Commandments and the equivalent Islam and that preceded me in that. Uh, so what I will do is I will mention the Twelve Commandments of the Quran. Uh, mention the Quran. The Twelve Commandments, um, out of these, many are similar to the Ten Commandments, but there are some that are it's a little different. Number one, do not set up another God with God, which means your focus, your obsession has to be not you, but God. Okay? Uh, number two, respect and be good to your father and mother, similar. Number three, help your relatives, travelers, and the poor. Number four, do not squander, nor be myself. Number five, do not kill your children for fear of poverty. Okay. Number six, do not go near fornication or adultery. Number seven, do not kill wrongfully. Number eight, do not approach or misappropriate the property of orphans. Number nine, be as good as your word. Number ten, be honest in values and ways. Number eleven, do not pursue what you have no knowledge of. Number 12, I'm going to end with this, so I'll keep this number 12 for my, for, for my conclusion. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to mention these, and I also wanted to give an example of how this was applied in the life of the Prophet Muhammad. In his treaty with the Christians, of, uh, with the monks of St. Catherine Monastery in Mount Sinai, um, yeah, and I just read the translation of the treaty that he conducted, he, that he uh, dictated, and it was written on it. The, a copy of this is available today, in, uh, written 1400 years ago. 
and this is an agreement between the prophet and all Christians using one example. Um, for example, being Saint Catherine Monastery. He says, and this is a message from Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, as a covenant to those who adopt Christianity, near and far. We are with them. Where he, I, the servants, the helpers, and my followers, defend them because Christians are my citizens, and by Allah, I hold out against anything that displeases them. No compulsion should be on them. Neither are their judges to be removed from their jobs, nor their bonds nor their monasteries. No one is to destroy a house of their religion, to damage it, or to carry anything from it into the homes of Muslims. Should anyone do any of these, he would spoil God's covenant and disobey his prophet. Verily, they are my allies and have my secure charter against all that they hate. No one is to force them to travel or to oblige them to fight. The Muslims are to fight for and defend them. If a female Christian is married to a Muslim, it is not to take place without her approval. She is not to be prevented from visiting her church to pray. Their churches are to be respected. They are neither to be prevented from repairing them nor observing the sacredness of their covenants. No citizen of the state of Medina or any Muslim is to violate this covenant till the last day. So this is the treaty that, this is just one example of one of the countless treaties he wrote to me. He had to different uh, communities. And uh, I just thought that uh, that was just amazing at that, that 400 to 300 years old to, to have such a uh, such a treaty. Um, when I sat in my chair, a group of you came and uh, you were standing and uh, and you started uh, or you ended with who and when you said who right because who okay. I just felt God I just felt a thrill because that's the invocation of the name of God. The name of God is who, or an attribute of God is who. Who is a you? Who is he who always exists? Okay? So everything is going to be uh, wiped off except who. So when we, when we started with the chanting of who, it was unintentional, I assume, but, but it really put into place the fact that this meeting, for the purpose, the purpose that we are here for, who is something that always survives. So something that always remains. It is a prayer that the outcome of this gathering will always remain, will always be in the presence of who. Okay, so, so we just call upon the he who always exists. Who and, and one of the zikrs or one of the ways that we call upon God is by saying Ya which means oh that always exists or uh, uh, that's always going to be he uh, or oh that always is whereas everything else is uh, and but well, is and is not and has the potential to be not okay? um, and the last thing <laughs> the last thing I want to tell you with is the third commandment in Islam which is a verse of the Quran uh, which says that the servants, okay, they come into the servant of God, the servants of the all merciful. So the word here is, it, uh, God defines himself in this case as the one who is full of compassion and mercy. So the servants of the all merciful are those who walk upon the earth. And I mentioned walking because you mentioned uh, uh, placing your feet on the ground and thinking of. God. So the servants of the all merciful are those who walk upon the earth with humility. And even when the ignorant address them, they say peace and salam. So the word of salam I will end my talk. Thank you. I understand this program has been going on for eight years now. How did it start? Uh, it started uh at the kind of instigation of a friend of ours from the Institute for Global Education, uh, Betty Ford, who uh, 
had noticed the International Day of Peace and felt that it would be wonderful if we could celebrate that day in some way. And uh, we did have a, a few events uh, for a year or two, and then we decided that we would like very much to have uh, an interfaith program. Several of the Instrument of Hope people are part of our worship service on Sunday. And I started hearing that they were thinking of planning a walk on the state at the same time that we were going to have the peace service in the chapel. So from then on, we made sure that they were always part of it and it more and more integrated their work and their ideas with ours. I thought that Interfaith Service today was amazing in celebration of the International Day of Peace. I think that peace is something that's needed in every person's heart and mind, and it was such a feeling of unity among humanity.